so uh, yes, uh, yesterday I watched the uh, Eurovision. I don't know if you guys know what that is. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, I finally understood why there's a new war in uh, Europe. It's so mm. that uh, Serbia could not win Eurovision. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right, yeah. And I don't, I don't know how relevant this joke is for people because you need to have watched <laughs> it. But basically, Serbia had a really decent, uh, with a okay message sort of uh, was, song. Cool. Moldova had cool. a hilarious one. Moldova mm-hmm. had a hilarious one where they just jumped out on stage and started playing harmonicas and just lost <laughs> their shit in like turbo folk shit. And like uh, when it comes to the critics, they gave Moldova like I think five, six points. But when it comes to viewers that watched it, they gave Moldova like 350 points. <laughs> so it, there was it. a big stark contrast between uh, what critics gave points to versus what the viewers gave points to, except of course. Ukraine, mm. Ukraine got all mm. the critic votes and mm. got all the all the individual votes. Which it must be kind of a pain for the for the Ukrainian uh, team because mm. uh, it was a decent song, as much as a song can be decent on fucking Eurovision. Uh, but it, people are either gonna think that they won because of uh, the politics and not the song, even though the song was good. Maybe not the best one, but then again, a song competition is weird because you're comparing different pieces of art which art by itself uh, yes can carry inherent value but the value is subjectively linked to that piece of art so you cannot compare it to another one it's like comparing frogs and apples it's uh, mm-hmm. it's weird but yeah yeah i finally understand why there's a war it's so serbia couldn't win the eurovision it was a very long play by uh, by certain uh, shadow uh, movements which orchestrated this whole thing, but uh, now, now they're uh, we've seen through their intentions. You got Nick's got a new conspiracy theory. It's the Albanians behind it again. <laughs> <laughs> now there was an epic moment. Speaking of Albanians, but not really speaking of Albanians, there was a very beautiful moment where all the little countries in ex Yugoslavia that fought wars against each other, mm. they ended up, because Serbia was the only one participating out of all of them in this year's final of the Eurovision, and they all gave Serbia like 12 points, like maximum points. Mm. We're supposed to be hating each other. So that was the most, the, the coolest part, the only reason why I didn't regret watching uh, watching that fucking shit show is because, like, okay, Tito is uh, still alive and the beating in certain mm. people's hearts, I guess, because... Uh, I did not see that coming, you know. Uh, uh, Peace in the Middle East, maybe not yet, but uh, mm. peace in the Balkans, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> mm. You guys need yeah, a Eurovision, yeah. Hakim. You guys need yeah, a Eurovision. Exactly. That's what's going to solve all your problems. <laughs> uh, Asia vision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need a, you know, a, what's it called? Arabs Got Talent. We already have an Arabs Got Talent, but you know what I mean. You know something I never understood about? Okay, it's called Eurovision, but like there's so many countries that are not technically, like quote unquote, Australia European. participates. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm like, well, what's the, what, what is the, what determines who gets to be on and who gets, is it just anybody who applies? Is it like the World Cup? You just have to like qualify? I don't get it. It's a strange question. I don't know the answer. The only thing I know is that they make you pay a very large fee in order to oh. be in the rooster. Uh, they make the whole country the rooster. pay. Yeah, the, <laughs> the roster. Okay. <laughs> very funny. But uh but I guess everybody felt pity on Australia, which we fe- feel pity on a country that's its own continent. Number one, number two, yes, as I said before, doesn't exist. But you know, it's it's its own <laughs> continent, so it doesn't get to participate in any other like continental events. So they were like, okay, I guess uh, Eurovision. You know, uh, we can't participate in the Euro League or Euro Cup. You know, when it's football, but I guess we can participate in. Uh, in very homoerotic uh, musical expression on on stage, so <laughs> uh, good for them. Uh, and obviously, Israel gets to participate, but not yeah, Palestine course, because yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, I think it was Iceland or something that pulled up a um, flag of Palestine on on Eurovision, Based. and they got fined. They got fined. Of course, and they did. They, they, yeah. uh, like the international uh, Eurovision syndicate or whatever said that this is a non-political event, the Eurovision oh, non-political. That's the funniest thing on planet yeah. Earth, and how they shouldn't have done that, and that's very messed up. Blah blah blah. 
But as we've seen that this year's show, there was one particular flag, which I'm not saying is either good, either bad, a bit performative in my opinion, but okay, mm. you do you. Mm-hmm. Uh, where mm. that, you know, uh, but that was not political in any way, uh, nor yeah, considered, yeah. nor actually it oh, was yeah. not only not considered political, it was considered the right thing to do because uh, we should yeah. uh, support uh, Please, okay, the, anti-war. The, 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 but, uh, yeah. the, the Israeli hit... I, <laughs> I've shot Palestinian children is, uh, is completely not political, okay? <laughs> it's an allegory about it. It's, it's about, you know, it's about dessert, okay? It's about different types of dessert. Um, but dude, there was a guy <laughs> with a rock hiding under the coffin. He threw it. That's why they could beat the <laughs> yeah, shit out yeah, of people exactly, holding the exactly, coffin. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and he, oh my God, yeah. Uh, we don't want to make, we don't want to date the episodes, but, but yeah. Look, by the time you're listening to this, something else has happened in Palestine, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the illegal Zionist entity. Uh, will not stop until it's brought down. So, uh, yeah, that's... A- <laughs> Which isn't that that's wild. Like, somebody's going to listen to this mm-hmm. in, like, a week or on Patreon or two yeah. weeks from recording uh, everywhere else, and they're going to be like, ah, you're, like, three weeks late with the war crimes that mm-hmm. are going on. <laughs> I, I know I'm, I'm <laughs> saying it jokingly, even though it's fucked up, but they happen so often that, yeah, like, yeah. talking about a thing mm-hmm. in two weeks, it's like, ah, that was, like, a war crime number 7,892. We're already at 8,000 something, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's almost growing it's like, as oh, fast they, as our Patreon. It's like, yeah. <laughs> that was awful. Oh, that was not good. No. Oh my god. Well, I was gonna say it's like they should. You, we, we're just gonna be casually chatting, but like, yeah, they shot another journal. So uh, they shot a journal. So it's like another one. Hmm? <laughs> right. It's like oh, Aye. it's the twenty seventh one this month. Oh man. Swiftly moving on from that topic. Uh, I was gonna say this is a, a side note for the intro, I guess. But thank you to everybody for the million listens, listeners, downloads. I don't fucking know, yeah. but it says one million on the thing. Okay, I don't know what to tell you. It says one million. <laughs> Thank you very much for the million whatever. <laughs> it is a sexy number, lots of zeros. Yeah. Makes us yeah. feel good. Exactly right. Yeah, I mean, seriously, okay. it's, that's huge for how long we've been doing this yeah. podcast. So thank you all so much for listening, and we hope you Sincerely. continue to enjoy our junk. Yeah, honestly. I yet I yet again reiterate, why the fuck do you people listen to us? But <laughs> thank you very much for, for doing so. We're, we're glad you do. <laughs> Keep, that was the yin. No, that was the yang. Now the yin comes. They listen to us because we are objectively the best podcast that was ever created. Yeah, and being the best yeah, podcast, boy. which is the best type of media ever invented <laughs> or created, we are literally the <laughs> best piece of media to have ever existed in humanity. Uh, I don't know why Os- the Oscars don't start including podcasts because uh, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, girl, we would fucking win the first one. Okay. Well, howdy, y'all. We are recording live from beautiful Zimbabwe. At least I am. That's why my <laughs> audio is probably not as good as uh, as usual. I don't have all my uh, big microphones and stuff. I am currently hunched over my laptop, watching the levels very carefully, making sure I keep it <laughs> right in the sweet spot. Oh, dang it, it went to the red. I'm trying not to go into the red. <laughs> Welcome um, to our world, JT. I know. I don't know how you guys do this. Uh, this is I'm suffering. <laughs> anyway, today we are going to be talking a little bit about housing. Uh, this is a very critical topic for Americans and Canadians as well. Um, a lot of places around the world where housing is a commodity, um, housing prices are vastly outpacing um, any other form of inflation. We got a lot of stats for you. It's going to be a doozy. So, boys, where do we want to start? Let's talk a little bit about housing. I think we can start with just the the the, the let's say the kernel of of the capitalist uh, perspective on housing, which is the the, the landlord, um, the mm. tick on the ass of every uh, <laughs> uh, young person. And going into the future, actually, vast majority of people in the middle age and a good proportion of people who are uh, in retirement age as well. Um, yeah. If you're unaware, a landlord is somebody who is the lord over land. It's a feudal position, of course, uh, <laughs> where you have these people who, by just you know a piece of paper, has decreed that they they own the the everything that you live in and you interact with, um, and that you have to pay them a, a fealty, <laughs> a fee uh, every month to to basically exist in the space mm-hmm. that you absolutely need to. Otherwise, you're going to be out rotting in the street. Um, historically, uh, landlords have been basically it's aristocratic usually aristocratic privilege or people have had money from illicit activities that build very shoddily built um uh, housing quickly uh, without any safeties whatsoever um for the rapidly uh rising um working class that's being moved from rural areas into cities 
Um, and these people were known as slumlords. Um, and uh, these people basically made their fortune off of um, very poor people who had nowhere else to go. Um, and of course, this is all facilitated by the powers that be. In the modern uh, sphere, though, a, a landlord usually, if you were to break it up, is different by different countries. Uh, but it's uh, depending on which stat you're looking at, it's either roughly 50-50 or it's more like 60-40, depending where you are, um, with the slight majority being to individual uh, owners um, having a few properties, and then like between 40 and 50% being uh, massive companies uh, or conglomerates that, ha uh, that own housings. Um, the difference being that if you have one guy, he is the one guy you have to deal with, you know, the landlord that you fucking text. Uh, meanwhile, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a conglomerate, then it's a very, um, uh, like business like transaction. Um, everything is very, uh, regimented and, and, and regular. Um, there's contracts, there's, you know, it's a, I mean, there's a contract with an individual landlord as well, but it's much more regimented, if you know what I mean. If you've ever had to interact with, uh, these sort of corporate type of, um, landlords. Um, but the one thing that unifies all of them is that they're all parasites. They all basically have a property that they feel um, uh, it gives them the right to profit indefinitely without any sort of circulation of capital, without any investment, without any actual um, con contribution to the economy. Right? It's something that they happen to have bought by virtue of them having more money than you. There's no, literally no other reason. Um, and as a result of that, you have to basically exist and be paying, I don't know, uh, $1,000 in rent, if probably a lot higher in the United States, every yeah. single month. Meanwhile, the bank denies you a, a loan for a mortgage because they think that you're too insecure to be paying $550 every month on a mortgage. So yes, <laughs> by the way, this is my, my little example. My, my personal example is this. Um, even as a physician, they fucking bullshit. It's like, oh yeah, well, you know, you don't make enough money uh, for us. Uh, you're an insecure, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Not, not lender is the person who lends the money. Who's the one who receives? <laughs> uh, borrower. Okay, yeah, the bottom, of course. The, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, um, exactly, my uh, the, the situation, you know, you're, you're too insecure of a borrower, um, so here, pay, like, double the amount that your mortgage would be um, as rent, uh, which is yeah. absolute bullshit, but yeah. Sorry, that was just a very, very uh, quick uh, and uh, annoyed Hakeem intro. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. That covered a lot of ground. Um, and one thing that I think uh, a lot of people leave out when discussing landlords is this kind of new breed of you know, what you might consider boutique property owners instead of landlords. Mm -hmm. So the people who mm -hmm. own cute little... The TikTok little people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the TikTok landlords. The people who own cute little Airbnbs. Uh, and that doesn't seem as exploitative as traditional landlordship, I imagine, to most mm -hmm. people. But it still often holds entire entry-level housing communities hostage. Um, so mm -hmm. like, for example, uh, Kelsey and I went to school in Alabama. And so we, when we were graduated, we thought, well, maybe we want to live around here. And so we looked around Birmingham in kind of the, you know, the entry level housing areas and, you know, cute little houses, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, things like that. And without fail, like the places we looked, the majority of the community was Airbnbs. Like they weren't available mm -hmm. for purchase because they'd all been snapped up by, you know, these um, entrepreneur types who mm -hmm. bought houses very cheaply did the the barest modicum of uh, updating and uh, and some painting and now they're held hostage for you know forever for decades and those those mm. houses could have gone to people who you know need to get their foot in the door as far as ownership goes uh, as far as getting yeah. out of the rent race goes and that's not now that's not possible because they're held hostage by these um, these landlords um, mm. But it also, you know, stuff like that also contributes to gentrification and it comes with a whole host of other issues. But that's mm. just one thing to keep in mind when discussing landlords is Airbnb hosts mm. also count as landlords. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they contribute exactly the, the um, I, I call it cute segregation. <laughs> um, because that's what it is. Literally, it's, it's trying to keep uh, non-white people out of communities. Yeah. But yep. because, oh, you know, they have like uh, baby blue walls or whatever the fuck white people mm. think is a nice color for walls. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sometimes, I, no, because I've, I've seen sometimes, I, I don't have TikTok, right? Um, but every once in a while, I see um, like compilations on YouTube that are recommended to me for some reason of landlord, uh, like TikToks. Um, and I see this shit and I'm like, oh, this, this thing that, that, that I, this exists in the United States. I don't think it exists really anywhere else. Um, but uh, you have like this really um, poor housing, basically, that exists somewhere in the US. 
um, and uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, like it's being sold, right? And you get these people who come in and really lowball a figure, right? Like mm-hmm. they, they pay like $3,000 for a house or something. That's really run down. They do the very, like the bare minimum. They, they just kind of fix up the walls a bit and maybe they give it a new coat of paint and maybe they just kind of like um, uh, put in like a window or two or something. Um, and then they just then sell it back. I, I yeah, think it's called flip flipping it. in, in, in mm-hmm. English. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They flip it, and but the thing is, they do this in incredibly poor communities, right? So the people who are selling it are being incredibly, are usually, by the way, ethnic minorities, uh, are being uh, lowballed on the offers, so they're being paid fucking nothing. Uh, and then afterwards, when these are sold, these are sold back into those same communities that don't have the um, money to afford them. So slightly wealthier, but some uh, with very wealthy people will come and buy up these uh, properties, usually as investment properties as well. They usually sell them to other types uh, that are like them. Uh, for renting and whatnot, and that slowly brings up property prices, which then makes the rest of the uh, neighborhood more expensive for these very low-income people, uh, which then drives them out, which means they have to sell their rundown homes, which basically causes this like flipping uh, um, uh, domino effect. And this you mm. see in many of the major cities. I, I think you saw it in in, uh, in Dallas, in Texas. You see it yeah. in many California places in California uh, on the East Coast as well. Um, there's even the academic r- uh, papers written on this uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's really messed up, and I think one aspect of, of it, which we won't delve too deeply into it but it's intrinsically connected is number one american cities are already segregated uh, according to race this was an intentional uh, mm-hmm. policy of urban design in the united states and this uh, new bullshit of flipping and airbnb renting and all this kind of stuff uh, directly reinforces those old uh, segregation lines uh, through gentrification and other methods so these are just stuff to keep in mind yeah always those who have uh, had previously as a group held lower capital as uh, capitalism's treatment of what uh, should be regarded as a human right but has been turned into a commodity uh, gets more uh, intensified as kind of a profit driving uh, tool the more they are uh, left out of it and uh, housing at this point uh, when you go down to the root cause of uh, why all of this happens is that it has not i mean it has be, it has been a commodity for a very long time but now especially in developed nations it's no longer uh, financially uh, logical for both lenders of money so we're talking about banks nor for developers of properties to concentrate on first time home buyers because they are far less of a secure group to sell to because you cannot at the end of the day trust them to pay back the money you are lending to them as much as you can trust larger firms or even relatively mid-sized landlord uh, companies to come up and swoop uh, entire sections of neighborhoods so as the as the profit motive for uh buying up as much land and as much housing increases which it does as prices for said land and property increase the lower the reasoning there exists for either banks or developers to actually construct anything not even for very poor people but even for what was before considered sort of the middle class we we're seeing as uh, cities grow and as populations in cities grow and as industries grow uh, that yes the average income and unemployment rate might fall but they are not linked when you look at almost any data to a direct increase in home ownership which is a uh, complete failure of the so-called American dream which promises you at least not only shelter but very very comfortable Mm. shelter and we'll talk about this later on in the episode but renting is not only seen by uh, people who are renters as the only viable potential way for them to find shelter because everything else is uh, expensive but renting is seen by developers banks and uh, massive uh, large-scale landlords 
as the future by themselves. Mm. This is a uh, active buildup of creating an environment which to them, it sounds insane, but to them is a much more sustainable business model than selling is. And even if we ignore uh, landlordism and, for example, look at... uh, some developers that build up very expensive buildings for extremely wealthy people to be able to buy in, they are even concerned with how unsustainable as a business model that is. So what they've introduced uh, is creating these extremely expensive lobbies at the beginning of the building, these very large pools, these instead of one gym for the building, there's a pool, uh, there's a gym on every single floor. Luxury, which not even necessarily is used by most of these build by most of these tenants and people who buy property in these buildings, but they're used to inflate just how much they have to, they will ask people who buy the apartment to still have to pay a monthly fee forever until they live there on a monthly basis. So even if you have money to buy, they have found ways for you to keep renting. Main point being, everybody who has money to build property does not think it should be directly sold to property owners because it makes no financial sense. You can squeeze them for a lot more bang for the buck, basically. So again, it goes back to a fucking systematic issue, which obviously we will uh, dive in uh, throughout the episode. Mm, yeah, amazing, amazing point. Um, again, it's like the the the, the commodifi- it leads into commodification of housing, but uh, uh, something I think that's very important that needs to be, that you mentioned that, I think a lot of, uh, you know, like discourse on this doesn't really center on is the very fact that this is now seen, not only seen, it's actively encouraged as an quote unquote investment opportunity, Mm -hmm. despite the fact that this is at the end of the day, a human right. People need housing. This is not something to play around with people being homeless and out of, you know, this is not like, you know, it it isn't a a joke. It's not something that is uh, pleasant for a sensible society, but capitalism that isn't, it isn't um, geared for, you know, sensible organization society is geared for the maximum amount of profit and the maximum amount of profit just so happens to mean that people will be homeless and dying in the middle of the winter um, on American cities in the largest country in the in the most uh, wealthy country on earth excuse me Um, but very very uh, important point Uh, I was gonna say um uh, something uh, also like just a side point um uh, i talked a bit about like you know this eth- ethnic seg- segregation and also of course lower income se- uh, segregation that happens uh, as a result of of, of uh, landlordism uh, but also uh, in as capitalism develops of course it tries to further in- uh, atomize uh, uh, family you know the the family groupings uh, into small and smaller units um so before you had this incredibly extended family where you could literally be a a, a great grandparents grandparents parents kids and even grandkids living in one house or one household um even by the way very wealthy people in the in the industrial per- in the uh, excuse me imperial periphery uh, like in my country uh, you end up people with like it's a fairly large home but it's still like multi-generational household but what capitalism does is it tries to um basically push on this uh, hyper individualist point and tries to um divide people further and further into small units until you are just the individual and this works better for them because it means that um you know instead of you uh and your brother and your parents living in one apartment your parents are in one apartment you are in your in one apartment and your other brother is in another apartment so you're occupying more housing uh than would exactly. be necessary uh especially at points of development like of course when you're a, a young man and you like you know want to live alone or maybe uh you're in a couple uh and uh, you, you want to have your own privacy that's one thing um uh, but this strange drive that i also see like in the united states where the second somebody turns 18 he has to leave the house yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, go and yeah. live yeah. in that's right? wild for Which, everyone else right Hakeem, it's not yeah. just for my brother yeah that it, is- it makes Makes no sense. Yeah. So you are no. you, go out, child, be eaten by the wolves. <laughs> that is how you learn. Yeah. <laughs> but but you didn't yeah, do yeah. anything up until he's eighteen to fucking teach him how to fight the wolves. But yeah. get the fuck out exactly, of my house. Yeah. That is strange mm. as fuck, man. Yes, sorry for interrupting, but it is very strange. Yeah, but like, I want to like everybody Americans listening. It's very yeah. fucking weird. <laughs> it's we- very weird. The rest of the world, nobody does this, right? Um, and that's just at one point. I'm not gonna harp on uh, in it too much. We can talk a lot more about it. But this is something that, and again, it goes into uh, like increased profits because individual consumption is better than uh, "quote unquote" group consumption. Um, you don't get the coupon bonus, uh, the mm-hmm. big group bonus <laughs> on housing. Otherwise, but yeah, <laughs> GT, there's something that I would really like your input on. I think you're the most qualified to talk about it because. 
in, in the rest of the world, of course, zoning laws exist everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But could you mm -hmm. please tell us, not, first of all, what zoning laws are and how they look like in the United States and how they limit uh, ownership or housing? Sure. So zoning laws, for people who aren't aware, it's basically the area you're living in um, gets to dictate what kinds of structures can be built in certain areas. So a one part of the city may be zoned for industrial stuff. So, you know, factories and, and wharfs and things like that, where another uh, section of the city might be zoned as uh, residential areas. And so only houses can be built there and things like that. Um, and you've got little commercial areas and things like that. So zoning is just, you know, how it's broken up in your little local Sims game. Um, in the <laughs> United States, we even take it a little bit farther. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty disgusting if you're not aware of it. Um, so in many wealthier areas of the U.S., it is illegal for developers to build affordable housing or even apartments. So even if it's zoned... Which is insane as uh, residential, you're not going to get affordable housing in these wealthier areas. Only single-family homes are allowed. And yet these rich people who live in these single-family homes still rely on the people who would be living in those affordable housing units, the low-wage workers, mm -hmm. to provide mm -hmm. labor for the businesses that they frequent. So where do those people live? They're forced to commute into these rich-only zones in order to serve their spiteful masters, the people who hate them, the people who want to keep them out of their communities. So it's very dystopian where, you know, you've got these enclaves of the, of the very wealthy. It's zoned for people to live there, but not the poor people. No, you're not allowed to live there. We're not going to build anything for you to be able to live in the place in which you work. And it's very, mm. it's disgusting to see. Yeah, genuinely. And this is the thing that absolutely uh, amazed me, that the very fact that the only thing in many parts of the, like, I remember, what was it, some someplace in Texas, or not, San Jose, San Jose, yep. has 96% or something only allowed for uh, zoning, like, zoning was 96% of the land available, you can only build single uh, unit or single family housing. That means mm -hmm. no apartment blocks, no multi-story buildings, nothing, it can only be single unit. That's why, um... Uh, again, to Americans, this probably seems very weird. Uh, but you, Gopnik, you're gonna definitely also think this is um, like this. Uh, Americans are weird about this. Whenever I see video or images of American cities, it looks weird because you see like flat, flat, flat land, and all of a sudden towers, right? Like like mm -hmm. uh, the the center, the quote unquote economic center, right, of the city. But after for miles and miles, you just see like literally like one story buildings or even two story buildings, and that's it. But every other city on Earth, you have like variation because you know they're multi story. Um, you know, there's mixed use. Um, uh, development, um, meaning that like usually you have the bottom floor, which is uh, or the first floor is uh, a store or some sort of like uh, business, and then the floors above that are housing usually, and there's streets in between, and they're usually walkable to at least to a certain extent. Um, while in the U in the U.S. you just have this fucking the cancer of, of suburbia, just su suburbs uh, of single unit housing or single family housing, and then finally leading into very inner city where there's a bunch of apartment buildings, and then that you know the ugly ass financial district with the with the glass buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's the weirdest an, thing. It's an unorganic way of build, building up cities because f it used to be, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have industry spring up in a certain part of town and that does what? That attracts people who want to work in that industry and then they come there and they they start living there uh, and it's that part of town which is known for like the meat plants and that's where the people working in the meat industry work in and around the industry or around like for example if it's in the mountain around the mines different mine towns get uh, get created in in places where there's a lots of farmable land that's where farmers come and live build up their houses and it sort of uh, gets sprung up because of utility but with incredibly f the incredibly fast paced movement of modern industries especially tech uh, they get to kind of come to a city which is already established and they have to pick a spot in which to build up their skyscrapers building etc etc and they end up building them uh, in uh, you know the financial centers of the city which they themselves have previously defined as the financial centers which end <laughs> up being pretty far away from where those same people working in that industry live at but 
usually those people working in the skyscrapers don't give a fuck the at least the higher position ones because it doesn't cost them too much to constantly uh, travel there or in the best case scenario they can afford to relocate to be closer to their work but those people who clean those skyscrapers those people who work in the restaurants and the gyms and the pools that I talked about previously in those same skyscrapers uh, as JT eloquently said they have to trek from basically across the fucking country to uh, even uh, <laughs> to, to log in in the morning with their little chips yeah. uh, and and it, it, that's only one part of, of housing going not making sense in the way it develops under the market because you end up completely changing the constitution of a given neighborhood because this decade, this neighborhood is going to be about this. And a lot of people move in and kick out the previous owners, et cetera, et cetera, and the previous renters because they're wealthier, thinking, okay, now I'm making this my thing. But in 10 years, the the constitution of the industry which lives in that neighborhood is going to change again. And then your industry that you're working is is going to be the the one uh, at the shit end of the stick. And it's going to be you <laughs> who, gets, uh, who gets kicked out. And we're seeing these generational sw- swaps between people that live in suburbia and people who live in downtown and then one group makes more money and then uh, they go out to suburbia because they think it's cool. Oh, now all of a sudden living in downtown is cool. So now they're moving downtown and kicking out the uh, poor people that were living there. And those people are moving out to the outskirts of the city, but then those get more money. So they, in 20 years, they end up potentially kicking out the other ones or the most realistic case, which is we all get kicked out because buildings are not being built to let people live in them by owning them, but yeah. to rent them. And the landlords, if they the rented out assets. all the fucking apartments, then the fucking price would fall. Just like you can't employ everybody, you, you got to keep some flats empty. So we end up not living anywhere and nobody's happy about the spot they live in. Nobody's happy with how big their apartment is. Nobody's happy with the fucking tables and chairs and, and TVs they can afford to to put in it. So this market that's supposed to fucking push, sorry, I'm going on a tandem, but it just fucking makes me angry. That's supposed to like give you the best possible product. Okay, you said, okay, housing is not a right. Housing is a commodity. Okay, okay, we agree. Okay, capitalism is great. So what do you do with commodities in the free market? Well, the people compete, companies compete, and the ones with the best possible product win. So the landlord companies, which we should all be renting from, are the ones that give the best apartment per price but oh my god maybe demand and supply don't actually work that way and there's literally more than enough people to go around without the landlords to having to directly fight each other but they all agree let's all give a shit product but uh actually compete on how little we pay construction workers to build up that that building so when I pay less to the construction worker I can afford to uh, make the guy renting pay less rent and that's how we're going to compete amongst each other not by actually building better housing for our renters and it's, a, it's guess what it is it's a snake that eats its own ass <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly right uh, no exactly right yeah yeah I'm getting ahead of myself but it's 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 it, and a lot of people feel this and they, they might not know how to put it into words i don't either uh, but it, it's it's such a pathetic obvious failure of what housing is supposed to be that i don't know how it, not everybody is losing their shit about it i mean people tend to when they want to buy their first home which was kind of s- something that i'm looking forward to doing right and then you get so fucking pissed and depressed that you just pull yourself back into yourself because you start, uh, I'm going to go all Zizek here, but you think mm. that <laughs> that is the natural state of being. But no, housing being like this is very ideological. It's a consequence of the capitalist setup that we've introduced. Mm. It's not supposed to be this. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, very uh, beautifully said. And something I, I I would like to add on top of this is that all this is delivered with so much ideology, particularly in the United, in the United States, but this kind of exists elsewhere as well, where, you know, this idea of the American dream, oh, you can have your apartment, you can have a house, you can have this and that, 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 um, all ownership, of course, it's all based on consumption. Um, but the reality is, I think the majority, or at least a very sizable minority of American young people uh, have roommates. They don't live alone. They don't have their fucking, ooh, you know, the, the sex in the city fucking apartment in downtown Manhattan they don't have that right they have a fucking shoebox they have a shoebox 30 kilometers away or what is that fucking 16.3 miles I don't fucking know um, from their uh, place of work right <laughs> sorry 
<laughs> I, I'm hating on Americans, I'm hating on landlords, and I'm hating on the uh, on the <laughs> imperial system. Okay, it's a perfect storm. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, but it's, so it's wrapped up in all this bullshit ideology. And then what makes it even worse is they lie to you further by saying, "Oh, you know, if you work hard, like you're just lazy, you should work hard, and then you'll have your own property and you can start renting out." When most people who fucking rent out are usually people who have got who just the, the only difference between you and them it's not hard work. Vast majority of the time, they just so happen to have more money than you, usually because they inherited it right so they they have a bunch of fucking uh, parents or old people uh, grandparents whatever relatives they die they get their assets they rent out their assets and then kind of just uh, what's it called the snowballs down into yeah. uh, like more and more property at least at least people who have one property they rent on the side that's not even Generally, this is not our, where our criticism is, is, is directed, all right? Uh, like if you your grandparents or whatever, they have one property to rent out, this is not against them. Neither is it if you're a young professional or a young uh, professional couple and you have one property on the side to rent out for economic security. Yes, you have to do what you have to do under capitalism. This, this is why this fucking system sucks. No matter how good of a human being you are, you can't act on the goodness that you have because you have to prioritize your own security first. And that means basically shooting somebody else in the foot and not allowing them, barring them from, from owning property, despite the fact that they clearly have shown that they have the ability to pay back a loan on, 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 on a mortgage. Uh, but my point being is the people who are even worse are these multi-millionaire fucking, you know, it's like a 27-year-old, but his dad owns some fucking mid-sized, I don't know, like trucking company or something. Uh, and then his he, his dad dies and then he inherits everything and he er inherits several million dollars or, or several properties, basically. And this dude's sitting like, oh, you know, through my hard work. And you see these people on TikTok, like, oh, through my yeah. hard work, you know. No, he's even worse. He's yeah. even worse. He's like, yeah. okay, his dad built up the trucking company okay we can have a debate oh he's the owner the workers actually blah 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 but he's like ah nah i don't want to deal with this trucking shit he sells all the trucks mm. he sells the trucking yeah. company and he buys like 70 apartments and then he's like i'm a rent for the rest of my life yeah. it's, it's, it's wild. i saw dude i saw this i saw this this uh again i don't have tiktok but i saw this on one of these uh what's it called uh, compilations um and it's this dude who's uh he by the way throughout all his clips he goes out of his way to show uh, to, to be like uh, to not say where he got the money from it turns out that it was one of these cases he's his dad was somewhere in the midwest or his granddad or something and he had some oil business or not in the midwest somewhere in the, they had some some natural resource business in the u.s basically mixed with transportation right mm. the guy died and he did exactly what you up and he said this guy just sold everything made, it took all this liquid uh, like ad cash and then just start buying property fucking everywhere right and then he had he showed like his spreadsheet of what he owns um, and he was like oh this is how much I make off of rent and it was hundreds of properties and in a single month off of rent alone he makes over two hundred thousand dollars Jesus Christ two hundred thousand fucking dollars bleeding people dry off of work he didn't do again yeah. like this is yeah I mean the, 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 my issue with this is uh, like capitalism has this way of trying to uh, give entitled people an excuse to be like, oh yeah, but no, I did all this fucking work. Well, I mean, I don't care how much work you did, right? There are people working a hundred times harder than you and smarter than you, and they mm -hmm. don't have the uh, the income. It's all boils down to 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 uh, luck and um, uh, inheritance, or or mm -hmm. basically. Uh, um, and by the way, we're all, when we're talking right now, we're talking about mid size uh, people like this particular douche. Where, if you're talking about established families that have huge amounts of uh, income because they own private companies that uh, are basically uh, housing companies that they've had for uh, fucking decades, if not even over a century. They exist in the United States, for example. Uh, and these people have usually gotten their wealth through very, very illicit means. Um, a lot of them start started with, first of all, of course, political... Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, what is it called in English? Uh, political preference, like they, mm -hmm. they, they yeah. uh, nepotism. They, they pulled, they pulled strings. Number one, number two, through slum lording, or number three, through little like robbery, actual like you know poor yeah. people during the depression having to sell their homes, so they buy up shit, right? This, this sort of stuff, which happened by the way in two thousand eight as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's just a cycle that in the end of the day, the vast majority of people don't benefit from it. It's only the slimmest fucking group of people at the top who are the ones who basically then buy up the ad space and have political influence and all that kind of shit to be like, oh no, actually this stimulates the market, blah, blah. We're going to get into their arguments in a second towards the end of the, the, the episode. Uh, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, um, this hurts 
all, the vast majority of society is hurt by this. But just because it causes profits for a very slim minority, all of a sudden it becomes okay. Not only this, it becomes laudable. It's an investment opportunity. This is the, your way out of the middle class existence. And that's why um, after the, we, if you remember our episode on um, uh, the, the Great Re Resignation, that nonsense, where people are like, instead of uh, getting out and unionizing, you saw a lot of new uh, attempts at creating small businesses. So they want to enter into this uh, this upper middle class idea of, oh, I, I grow my own business into something. Housing is like this too. Where rather than thinking, hey, we should re entirely restructure our housing uh, market and not even have a fucking market for this shit, but actually mm -hmm. make sure that there's a human right that is met. Uh, instead, people are thinking, oh, you know what? Fuck everybody else. I need to make enough money so that I can start getting property so that I can start, I can become one of the oppressors. Instead of being have, licking the boot, I can be the one who has his boot licked, basically. Yeah. And when you put on the boot, you, you, you really want to like clean it so that you don't <laughs> feel like you're putting it on anybody's neck. Mm. It, it, yeah. Brilliant points. And the only thing I would like to add is that mid-sized guy that, that sold his dad's uh, oil company and now wants to be a land leech, or oh, I meant landlord, uh, <laughs> he will get swallowed up as well. I mean, at some point, yeah. even these petite bourgeois, I mean, they're far from it. They're massive landlords in that case when we're talking about that guy. But the petite bourgeois in general, the mid-sized capitalist, will end up being swallowed up by massive multinational investment management corporations, like, I don't know, like BlackRock, mm -hmm. who at one point will buy out all of these landlording companies because they would come in with such an offer that they can't refuse. And for them, obviously, property is a kind of a bedrock of, of their asset portfolio. And you will end up in the long run if nothing is done about this with a few companies that just own all the fucking property and then we'll all mm. it, and they will be the ones that define who gets to live where uh but yeah i just wanted to introduce intrude with that that it's 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 the the the, the, the ha the way housing is being used, the extent to which housing is being used as a commodity right now without any regulations will end up biting even mid-sized to even some larger sized landlords in the ass. But they're they're digging their own grave because they think, oh, I'll get a you know a payout out of this, et cetera, et cetera. But at one point, your leachy way of making money will no longer be an option because even you, rich guy, you will not have enough capital to com compete with the actual big boys. And, oh, my God, I'm 45. I've been a landlord my whole life. You will have no life skills and you'll end up in the gutter just like the rest of us. So mm. It's, it's, mm. everybody's like running around thinking they're being the boot, as Hakim said, on somebody else's neck. But very often they're putting it on their own as well, which is so fucking yeah. funny. And, and, and if there is one thing to be like kind of looking to be looking forward to as the world collapses around us in capitalist filth is that a lot of the capitalists are going to get fucked as well. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I completely agree. Uh, I was going to say, um, uh, there was another thing because we were talking about also uh, how yani, young people in, in the US have to uh, have roommates. Um, and we also were mentioning the, the, the fact that there is gentrification, segregation, etc there's a concept of course uh with many horrible concepts of the american existence but one of them is called redlining <laughs> mm. i was wondering if uh, jt you could please uh, inform us about oh god <laughs> yeah okay so redlining the u.s is notorious for redlining and if you don't mm. know what that is it's the process of essentially preventing certain populations from living in quote-unquote desirable areas um, mm. So you know, like the, I wonder the... what you mean by certain populations. <laughs> mm. I can't I possibly wonder. imagine. Um, <laughs> so this was especially common in uh, starting around the 1960s, uh, predominantly with black applicants. Um, so Donald Trump's dad actually got in trouble for straight up telling his salespeople, "Do not rent my housing units to black people," which is, mm. uh, you know, it, it was as, about as clear <laughs> a case as it gets of of redlining and. Uh, and so you can see these if you search um, like redlining maps on Google Images, mm -hmm. you'll you'll come up with a bunch of these maps where you'll see you know actual sectors of the map you know circled and shaded in red. Like okay, these are the poor people areas. All right, these are the desirable yeah. to live areas. Okay, we're not going to let them buy here and here and here, etc. And it's it's all very planned out. It's it's very much segregation, um, and it's it's you know it's ongoing to this day to an extent, yeah. especially especially with the the zoning of the single family homes thing. I was going to say what's so interesting is if you look at um, the ethnic uh, division in, in ma major American cities, they're almost one-to-one 
with those with the redlining policies mm-hmm. that were uh, yeah. drawn before the 60s or even uh, or around the era the, around the era it's insane how like the, the how inbuilt um, uh, discrimination and and uh, inequality is built into uh, mm-hmm. every aspect of american society in the psyche uh, american psyche american legal system american housing market everything you know it even goes to the point that and this is fucked up uh, when i was reading about this because i was like they can't be this evil and the united states is always that evil <laughs> um you know, uh, at the time, uh, because uh, African Americans weren't uh, allowed, to, um, uh, they couldn't afford their own um, vehicles, uh, like uh, passenger vehicles, right? So yeah. they usually would have to take buses. So do you know what they would do around major or uh, around um, what's it called? Um, uh, pleasant areas of cities where you know the the, the areas that you want to live in, right? They would build these low rise bridges that would be too low for a bus to pass under. Only mm. passenger vehicles can pass under, and this was a subtle way of trying to prevent African Americans from entering into the quote unquote pleasant areas. The only way you can get there is in a car because it's too far from where you live, and the only way uh, that the only form of car you can get in and get in there too is a passenger car, a bus won't make it underneath that bridge it's too low and since african americans aren't allowed uh, or basically are basically they're essentially barred for all uh, intensive purposes they're barred from ownership uh, of vehicles they wouldn't be able to enter these you know it's this yeah it's fucked up segregation that's yeah yeah the wild levels that they go to to like yeah forbid people that look different than them from walking in their streets i was gonna say the current u.s president was like practically a segregationist <laughs> <laughs> like what the fuck man yeah. like it's Oh my god, like, you know, sometimes you, like, this this, this, this kind of irritates me, like, sometimes people will be, like, anti-Castro, for example, they're like, oh, because he had, uh, you know, um, what's it called, he, he said some anti-LGBT, or anti- he was homophobic when he was younger, right, uh, and then basically, like, oh yeah, and they'll uh, they'll denounce him to the fucking moon, basically, even though he's not only uh, recounted his, his uh, position, but has tried everything else to fix the uh, issues that he helped create in the, in the first place, like, he actually atoned for what he tried to do, meanwhile, you have actual fucking segregationists yeah. in the American, in congress and the senate and as a fucking u.s president right and nobody gives a shit you think he changes opinions you think he looks at black people any different no he's a fucking no. political scoundrel he knows what he's doing he knows how to stay in the game just like how hillary clinton literally in a uh, in one clip she's like oh no um uh, marriage is a sacred institution between a man and a woman and two years later she's like no no i believe in, in uh, <laughs> uh the right to gay marriage the they're fucking <laughs> oh my god uh, I'm, I'm actually very sorry i apologize but this stuff really Ir- the, the hypocrisy of the American um, political class really irritates me. And what makes it worse is that l- American liberals, uh, ooh, well, well-meaning, bleeding heart fucking liberals, will look at this shit and be like, "Oh, I see nothing wrong with this. Uh, absolutely not." Meanwhile, their actual attempts uh, of uh, uh, socialism, which had their flaws, but would attempt to correct those flaws, these people they don't even they don't even want to look at those examples. But they are, they're going to give the, the the segregationist or the guy who bombed Yugoslavia they're going to give him a thousand one excuses. Please fuck off. I I have a joke. Uh... Joe Biden won. <laughs> Joe Biden won on the platform. I have a black friend. Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's chocolate, chocolate chip, and Obama was my friend. Oh my god, Obama was my friend. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be, I can't be a segregationist. I mean, I was VP mm-hmm. to a black president, and that yeah, is how the yeah, planet yeah. works, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Absolutely, give him chocolate, chocolate chip. <laughs> I mean, the other day <laughs> he said he he went on stage and he said, you know, back in the day we had real segregationists, and but we'd always go to lunch together. It's like Jesus Christ. Uh, I wonder who couldn't go to lunch with you though. Hmm, <laughs> I wonder who wasn't allowed at the table, Joe. Who? <laughs> You fucking piece of shit. Oh my uh, god. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> it's like I'm not, um, I'm now imagining like uh like uh what was that solid snake and then you have uh what's yeah. the other one when he's pissed off liquid? type of snake from Metal Gear. Oh, which Metal Gear are you talking about? There's Liquid Snake, there's Venom Snake. Like there was the Big one boss, meme right? with Bernie Sanders where there's normal Bernie Sanders Oh yeah, 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 Venom, Venom Snake, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Venom Snake. Yeah. What was it? Venom Snake, yeah, from Fanta Pain. V- yeah. Venom Bernie Sanders. I'm imagining yeah. Venom uh, Joe Biden being like a weird copy <laughs> of Putin where Putin told the Ukrainians, "You want to see the the decommunization, I will now show you real decommunization." <laughs> and, but but Joe Biden, but Joe Biden says, uh, "You want your safe spaces to segregate you?" I will now give you real <laughs> segregation. <laughs> oh, he looks evil. Is that just me? He looks so fucking evil. Like, okay, Trump looks looked like lost, an idiot like... to me. 
Yeah, Trump looked stupid. He's he's just yeah. he looks like an idiot. He he was like, I'm just gonna do this for the memes, and then he realized, oh fuck, I actually won this shit. I don't think he ever had an intention of, of getting to power. I think they've even proven it. Uh, like yeah. when he in his, his private Lady, like, conversation. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. P- poor, you know, like post. Uh, you, look, th- she should at that point she sh- she should have become a Titoist. She was like, the collapse of Yugoslavia <laughs> was the worst fucking thing to happen to me. <laughs> Trump, I have this idea. Like, okay, this idea, like, uh, uh, worker self management. It, it's gonna be really good in the south. <laughs> Trump, oh, coming. It's, it's, international they have the in fuck, the background. This is how we the, do the it, fucking, guys. Yeah. There's the Reagan quote. What's it? The, the Reagan co-op quote. Hold on, I'll bring it up. What the fuck was it? Uh, I am not gonna find it. Whatever. Yeah, he's talking shit about the federal government, dude. Shut up. Okay. Don't you have like black people to to uh, to impoverish? Yeah. him and thatcher it's it's like look like there's like a rotisserie in in hell and it's like it has several prongs uh and it's going up <laughs> thatcher's reagan's uh uh what's his name uh poland cow uh, poland cow colin powell colin powell colin powell <laughs> colin powell's his name is colin so it's relevant right yeah. uh and uh, what's the, what's the other woman the the witch um, the oh, one that recently uh, died. Uh, Albright. Albright, yeah. Uh, Albright's ass, and then the fifth prong is the fifth prong is is still empty. It's being primed for Kissinger. Um, once he fucking makes his <laughs> way down there, uh, and uh, if, if they're just gonna be slowly, uh, you know, forever and ever fucking roasting over all the crack that they didn't sell into black communities. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, oh my god. Jesus Christ. Oh, that me. and the unsold fucking uh, 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 that and all the broken M16s that the yeah, uh, that oh, the God. Vietnamese um uh, you know oh my god anyways uh <laughs> huge tangent aside <laughs> so probably, I was you know, say, but not to, when we're talking about segregation there's probably uh even back then and today like efforts to uh prevent uh these residential policies uh, as they exist today, especially in, in the United States. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's actually a a new effort in the states to prevent more than three people who aren't related living in the same yeah. residence. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Uh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, I was confused by it. Yeah. So like every, you know, just about every college student goes through a period in their life where they live with, you know, two, three, four other people in the same apartment because it's just, you know, that's how they can afford it. That's how they can pay the rent every month. And now so there's this push to make that illegal. You can't have more than three people who aren't related living in the same residence. So this hurts things, obviously, like uh, like communes, collective living uh, environments. Mm. But it also makes the average low-wage job completely insufficient to afford an apartment like that. Mm. So like young people living together as roommates is good experience for Americans who are often isolated from their peers, right? We're just intensely atomized here in the States. But, you know, like I said, it's also essential to being able to pay their rent. And so this one change to housing policy will both contribute to the continued alienation of workers from each other and feed this mindset that we have in the U.S. of of hyper-individualism, of doing everything yourself, of not relying on anybody else, of not relating to anybody else, of not working together with anybody else. All of this stuff is very intentional. It's done with a purpose in mind. And we just need mm. to keep. We need to be aware of that as it keeps happening. And so, and it's so wildly hypocritical mm. because at the same mm. time they're introducing legislature to make everybody go back to the office. Mm-hmm. Like they're yeah, not yeah. letting you sleep in the same place with other people. But when you gotta come here and get exploited, then you can be as many people that are not related to you as you want. <laughs> Actually, we will force you, and we yeah, will force yeah. you to pay for the metro uh, ticket uh, there, and the cab, and the Uber, and then back, and then the food in the office. That's when, when uh, you know, it's important for the economy to come back uh, to the forefront. Mm-hmm. That is why you must uh, fuck up your daily schedule, but uh, when it comes to actually living with people that you like, that you, you know, can also fuck, because you know you're not related <laughs> do not fuck your cousins guys please uh, it's, it's all of a sudden uh, absolutely insane like th- uh, there we go this is it's the bigger conspiracy capitalism leads to incest it makes you only live <laughs> with people you related to oh my god see this is the, uh, the, the um, Alex Jones was right all along these are <laughs> demons people <laughs> kill the child <laughs> corrupt them all <laughs> It's the doom music. <laughs> but no, I was the, the want you to fuck yeah. your sister. Mm. They're corrupted. Yeah, exactly right. They're putting incest in the water. 
<laughs> oh man but anyways uh the, the the thing as well is that they don't realize on the political scale there's a stupidity but you know individual people uh uh medium to large size landlords but still individuals um these are the same people who don't realize that these policies will result in low wage workers having to live very far away from their uh places of, of, of uh, work um, and as a result, they're going to have a very long commute, which means as a result, generally, there's going to be a, a lower supply of workers that want to come to these jobs because they, or not or even have the ability to because the gas price would be so expensive or it would be like it's prohibitive in many different aspects. So as a result, you end up exacerbating the current issue of, oh, the great resignation. Oh, nobody wants to work these jobs, blah, blah, blah. Um, as well as basically just driving up fucking uh, um, like the environmental damage because of ca car centric culture in the United States, which means more driving. By the way, coincidentally, uh, shares of of, of uh, gas companies have been going up, and I'm, mm. uh, and and uh, so quite a few Congress and Senate uh, Congress members and senators in the U.S. have sh uh, shares and uh, uh, ownership shares in, in, in uh, gas companies. <laughs> hmm, I wonder where that, that must be a pure coincidence. Sure by the way. I, absolutely, you know, yeah, no, no, no way, no way, guys. What, are you are you some sort of communist? Like this is this is. <laughs> alarming that you have such conspiracy theories but anyways let's bring it back on track on why the issues with renting um if you are born to parents who are renting you are more likely going to be a renter yourself than somebody who will own now the reason for this is because when you are renting you're taking a substantial amount of your uh, check at the end of the month and you're not using it to put in savings or to put into investments or whatever else you're using it to be put into uh rent and sometimes this can be, if you're very lucky, it can be like 20% of your paycheck. But in especially major cities where all the good jobs are, um, this is as high as 40, 50, 60, even 70% of your paycheck. Now, if you're putting 70% of your paycheck away for rent, that means you barely have enough left over for utilities and, and uh, you know, um, basic living expenses, insurances, and stuff like that. And, oh, maybe you're going to have an avocado toast or two. And that's why you need to cut that out, okay, by the way. Uh, that's the way you, that's the way to making making out of, uh, you know, poverty wages, all right? The only thing stopping stopping you from becoming Jeff Bezos is uh, two uh, fucking uh, lattes a, a week, all right, please. Um, <laughs> you know those small pleasures in life that make life, you know, slightly more bearable? Cut all those out, right? You should you should. <laughs> work shit and sleep and your sleep should also be cut down all right work on that uh the side hustle yeah but my point being is if you're contributing such a large amount of your paycheck into uh into rent that means you won't be able to save anything or put anything towards investment which means that most likely you'll never be able to build up the capital necessary to meet the 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 uh, bare minimum to own uh to 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 get a loan to buy a house right now compare this with somebody who most likely owns or uh, their parents own so these people usually they'll inherit a bunch of money or will have a greater ability to uh, um, accumulate capital, have some money saved over, to be able to afford the loan. Now, this is a basic, uh, the, the, this is the first layer. Now, imagine their kids, right? Th so they had two generations prior to them that owned homes, right? So they're going to have not only a larger inheritance, but even a greater ability um, to, to save money. Most likely, they're going to have be inheriting more than one single property. And with this third generation, then this will, of course, co compound down to greater and greater wealth, right? And, of course, mm -hmm. more properties. What this is, is an a, a engine for social inequality. Now, this particular example is not very accurate because we're talking about single families. This is not really the, the way it works in the United States. In the United States, it's usually a family that where they uh, have already inherited massive amounts of, of property. I'm talking about these middle to large uh, uh, ownership families, right? So one, basically one guy who has maybe six properties, let's say, and his kids end up getting those six properties and then they make from the money of that, they accumulate and accumulate and they get it to 10 or 15 or even 20 properties. And then the third generation can get it even into 100 properties properties and then that po point you have this agent or, or again this engine which greatly accelerates as time passes um like it's almost like a logarithmic scale for for social inequality um and this is a funnily enough when you look at the research for this this is exactly what's been happening in the united states um in some parts of southeast asia uh, where they don't have uh, uh, laws uh, against uh, this sort of stuff um in europe recently it's been slightly prohibited but many of the restriction laws are being lifted uh, for example even the social democracies oh the ones that they fucking liberals in the u.s love so much um they're being lifted uh so uh places like um oslo and stockholm and and, and uh, copenhagen are absolutely littered with homes that are owned by like it's one guy and he owns like entire streets um and so on and so on what this causes in the end is a calcification of your class origin you end your proletariat you end up dying a proletariat who's usually pro and their kids are proletarian in origin as well and you're uh, uh, as a result they're uh, renting Number one, uh, that, that's the first point. And number two, um, at the end of the day, you, again, to reiterate this point because it's not uh, reiterated enough, you, at the end of the day, if you had gotten a loan somehow, 
right? You would have been making consistent payments on that loan because there are people in the United States currently who are 60 and above who have been making consistent rental payments since they have been 17 years old, but they've never been able to um, qualify for a loan because they're oh, too insecure to pay back despite the fact that they have 40 years of consistently paying every single month a, you know, so... Um, also, uh, a point that uh, you have mentioned, but uh, again, to, to mention again, uh, usually, as uh, with inflation, um, rents go higher. Um, and as rents go higher, not only do uh, people who, for example, get, like, let's say inflation went up, so you got the slightest bit of a um, pay increase by 1% or 2%, but as a result to uh, make up for uh, the quote-unquote loss that the uh, landlord uh, would make, they increase rent by 7%. So in the end, you're actually way outpaced and you end up paying even more. And this is, of course, something that uh, we've seen across um, the world and probably in your personal experience within the last year, year and a half. Like not to ramble on, but the entire uh, institution of landlordship and renting specifically is built around keeping you poor. Yeah, that's exact. You're exactly right. And uh, for my for our U.S. listeners here in in the states specifically, if you're not getting an annual ten percent raise at work, your pay isn't keeping up with inflation. That's we're on a very bad track here. Everything is getting more expensive. Mm-hmm. And cost of living is rising the quickest. So if if your wages aren't increasing, like the minimum wage hasn't been uh, adjusted from seven twenty five in how long now? Eleven years over a decade? Yeah, please, okay. In, in twenty fifty, we're gonna get the fifteen dollar fifteen dollar an hour uh, minimum wage. Okay, all right. And then that. Yeah. Point, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's that's exactly right. Though reminder, it should be twenty four dollars an hour if it had just kept up with inflation, and it's seven twenty five. So that's it's it's something to bear in mind. It's it just is bootstraps. Okay, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, JT. This is the, you sound like a a beta liberal soy boy cuck. All right, that's true. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and 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 if you were to just you know be on the grind, right? If you were to 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 have a, a alpha mindset, right? A mindset for the grind set. Mm. If you were to invest in crypto, okay, <laughs> and you yeah. were to uh, start your drop drop shipping business, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm just this stuff at some point is just um, so irritating. You can't even take it seriously anymore. And the reason that this, by the way, I'm not taking this very seriously right now. The reason that I'm, I'm like more memeing and makes me so irritated is because literally the only thing that's preventing you is a bullshit like uh, assessment of what they perceive that you'll be able to pay. Yeah. And as a result of this, you are uh, prohibited. Uh, you are banned absolutely from owning your own property not that owning property doesn't have its own issues we're gonna get into this in just a moment but uh, the very fact that this limitation exists and in a supposedly free country where oh we're not like the fucking communists mm, you know despite the fact that hey uh, the, um uh, you have could you please remind me remind me you come from a post yugoslav uh, state what percentage of the population roughly owns their their, their homes over there just it's just a ballpark a ballpark figure I believe right after Yugoslavia fell apart, it was, I think, around 85% or something. And the 15% that uh, didn't own them, uh, didn't. uh, it was 85% that live in their own property. So there was around 15% that had to travel across the country to work in a different place. So they would... uh, they would rent, but also rent was so insanely highly regulated that you would like rent a room in somebody's bigger house that they they had because they had a lot of children. But then those children went to whole, went to school. Uh, but uh, I think at the worst at worst of times it was around seventy percent when uh, housing was even being built up and there was nowhere to actually put people. Uh, wow. But it's it it was yeah a completely different ball game yeah. yeah. In in if you look at uh, also other former socialist ca- uh, countries Poland, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia or Czech the Czech Republic and modern day Slovakia the Yugoslav countries as you have mentioned uh, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the, um, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia the uh, percentage is almost consistently uh, between 80, 85 and 95 percent in Cuba it's be- it's between 90 and 100 percent same with DPRK um, it, it and the examples go on and on now but those numbers uh, are Europe falling been- very rapidly after. After the fall of, course, of their yeah. forms of socialism, very, very yeah. rapidly. Mm. Exactly right, yeah. But the point I wanted to make is, uh, if you notice uh, what you said, at worst of times in Yugoslavia, it was around above 70% ownership. Uh, JT, could you please just <laughs> run us by a figure? What, what is the percentage right now <laughs> of people who own their homes in the U.S.? The thing about the U.S. is it's pretty misleading. So they claim the national rate of home ownership in the U.S. is 64.8%. Now... Mm. The thing about that is, I don't know about you, dear listener, 
but I know, let's see, exactly two people my age that own a home. The rest of everybody I have experience with, everybody I've interacted with online, everybody I know personally, rents and will continue to rent because they simply can't Mm -hmm. afford to get a down payment on a home, especially now. So I'd be very curious to see what the breakdown is for millennial and younger uh, Mm. people who are interested in in buying homes because that, you know, I can't imagine that being more than 25% would be my guess. I, if I remember right, uh, I'm, I looked this up a little while back, but if I rem- remember right, the highest possible figure for millennial ownership was like 27%. Oh, yeah, there you go. Right. In, this, in the Soviet Union, when you got married, you got a, a, an apartment. That's just how it was. Wow. You got married, you got an apartment. By the way, you want to know, okay, if I had Soviet Union, second largest uh, economic power uh, in the world at this time, blah, blah, blah. How about this? Libya. When you got married, you got an apartment. Libya, a third world country. Okay. Iraq was no different. And even now, when capitalism has reintroduced some of these places where it was not present during that period, funny enough, because most families own homes, they had the ability to save up a bit more money so that they can help out their kid with the down payment for their first flat. It's like it's like a common Balkan thing that it's even to an extent expected of you as a very, very good parent when you can. I'm not talking about wealthy people. I'm talking about the average person. It's kind of expected, not expected. It's kind of something that you would be extremely proud of yourself for doing when you, uh, after post-university, give your kid a flat. Nothing fancy or whatever, but because everybody knows how insanely difficult it is to get a place to live in, people try and help them out because they know that they didn't have to have that problem because the state often quite literally handed them the keys and asked them just to pay like a small transactional task, which if I remember correctly, there was a lot of protests about like, oh my God, you're making me pay like 200 (laughs) the equivalent of what is 200 bucks now to get this flat. This is like the state is profiting off of us. This is disgusting. (laughs) You know, we're talking about different planets here. Like these are Mm, not the same uh, civilizational experiments at all. But just to kind of uh, move us into, into, it's not even in the next point we can touch on it but one experiences rent and is super pissed off but somehow manages to save or as we said was lucky enough for his parents to help him out or was born with a bit more privilege etc etc and now you go and you buy well it used to be you could actually save up enough capital and you go and you buy a house how with a nice little briefcase full of money or with a nice little check from your bank account which has the full amount of 18,500 for this beautiful house but now that same beautiful house costs 875.15 thousand <laughs> uh, yeah. and you will not be going anywhere with a check of that much saved especially yeah. not for your first home or I would argue even when you're in your late 30s or even late 40s if you're lucky maybe and like we're i don't know an expert engineer or some shit but uh so what do we have to do instead of paying rent to the landlord we go to the bank and yes we agree to conditions that are far better objectively than that with the landlord because we end up with the property in the end but we end up, again, being dependent on a private for-profit institution who, at the end of the day, let's be very, very honest with ourselves, owns your house until you pay it off. And mind you, a bit of sidetracking here, but landlords really figure this out, this argument that I just like mm. said out loud, and they really push it super hard. And they've been pushing it for the last 10 years that it's financially wise and smart to rent and not get a home of your own. Because, mm-hmm. hey, the couch breaks. Your landlord has to fix it. If you own the apartment and you break the couch, it is you who has to fix it. It is you who has to fix the uh, fucking uh, the roof, et cetera, et cetera. And yet you're paying almost the same amount of money or the same amount of money as uh, to the bank as you do to the landlord. But with the landlord, you get an extra service. But obviously they never mentioned that with the landlord, he can kick you out whenever he wants and you do not uh, mm-hmm. get yeah. the fucking apartment in the end. But the, the I, again, it's funny. You save so much to escape the landlord and yet you replace him with another 
kind of relatively favorable, a uh, more favorable one, but still a, a leech uh, that's not going to be off your back until you pay back it, not only every single cent, but with a very, very hefty interest on top. And it's wild that we're fucking fine with it. it it's mm. like yeah. a lot of people say, okay, whoa, eight, when you ask 70% of millennials say that they'll never, uh, that they never think they will be able to own a home, right? And then you ask the 30%. And out of those 98% of those 30% that think they will be able to own it, will not own it. They will make a contract <laughs> with a bank which will own it. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. absolutely nobody except 1% or 2% can actually buy a home <laughs> by themselves. Yeah. And I would yeah. say yeah. 70 you can't buy a fucking house. You can't buy a fucking motorcycle. People buy, the, 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 we buy TVs. Like TV is <laughs> the big promise where I can watch my fucking commercials and my NFL and shit. You buy, well, you buy it on loans. Ukraine, you buy a fucking yeah. TV in a box yeah. that shines. Yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> My first microphone <laughs> to make a fucking YouTube channel, I took like a two-month fucking credit thing. And then it ended yeah, up yeah, yeah. being bad. I couldn't return it. it, was, it we, we're just getting fucked every day and not in a good way. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember um, I mentioned this in one of the early episodes, uh, but I, I had a friend who had somehow a connection to Fox News. Uh, and I would l- l- just watch in awe of the fucking ads that were on American television. One mm. of which was like, um, uh, it's like, you know the advertising is fucking appliance i don't know it's like oh you pay it's like it costs like blank let's say like oh um costs like 900 dollars or um what's it called uh uh 15 uh monthly payments of like 19.99 <laughs> and then underneath in like really small text it's like 15 percent um interest rate i'm like jesus yeah. fucking Christ. <laughs> what is this shit what is this Don't buy even a oh fucking milkshake maker i was as a kid i was like oh my god look at these beautiful capitalists they got fucking milkshakes but now you gotta get get a load to buy a fucking milkshake and milkshake suck as well <laughs> objectively except the cherry uh, on top uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that i think is worth mentioning um it, this is especially common here in the states and you guys tell me if it's if the same for you so mm. m- most people here see a house as a good investment that's pretty much a universally understood thing in the u.s and you know in some ways it it is like when the market is hot you'll be sitting on a very valuable asset um, though, of course, any gains you'd make from selling it will likely be mitigated by the rising cost of whatever replacement property you'd buy. Like speaking exactly. uh, as of right now, like anybody who sells their house right now in the States, it's not going to help them really because it's going to be a wash. They're going to have to buy a house that's, you know, 300 percent more expensive than it was six months ago. Um, yeah. But, you know, in some ways, it's also a scam owning a home because I saw I saw a story of one guy. You may have seen it on Reddit. Um who built his house with his own two hands, and he paid it off decades ago. And since then, he has paid more in property taxes over the years than the cost of the house. So even if you own, you're still getting fleeced. But, Mm -hmm. you know, that being said, homeowners do get certain perks that are withheld from renters, um, especially uh, since COVID. Um, The most recent one being a mortgage freeze while renters still had to pay their rent every month. Mm. So, yes, homeowners are favored. And, yes, a home can be a tremendous asset if you manage to pay it off and if the market is hot. But it can also be a big liability. But what do you guys think? Is that is that sentiment similar where you are? Absolutely. Uh, Full time. Uh, Everybody thinks it's the you know, we we like to say uh, you either keep money under the mattress in the bank or in the walls, and in the walls mm-hmm. means you buy you buy property. Yeah. Property tax is very low, for example, here. But uh, except if you have a lot of properties, then it increases with the with more properties that you have. Um, but it but it's it's it, it is an investment to an extent, but one that again, just to not repeat myself, but is it's uh, very landlocked. It's you know, if you if you're a ship, you cannot actually get to it. If only very wealthy people can afford to look at housing as as an investment, everybody else just wants a place which they can. It, even though it's just emotional, but that they can call their own home yeah. in which to feel like they, it's not <laughs> about ownership. It's about a feeling of being grounded here and knowing that you cannot be, <coughs> sorry, and that you exactly. cannot be kicked <laughs> out at, uh, at any point, which again, it's kind of impossible today <laughs> unless you buy it cash, which nobody yeah. can. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're, gonna be bad. they're gonna be looking sideways. He was like, "Where do you?" <laughs> it's like, "Do you sell like illegal weapons? What do you do?" <laughs> you have to have the two buttons open with a gold chain so they know. But what was I gonna say? Um, it's different. I think in the in the imperial periphery, usually, um, housing is still very much a semi secure investment. Um, but at the end of the day, it all trends towards the American market. Like everything is slowly becoming like that. Right? It's just because all our capitalisms are not as developed as what you guys have. Um, oh boy, there's there's more goodness in store for us. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's 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 exactly this shit. Um, but I was gonna say also, uh, this is something that's not mentioned or, or spoken of a lot either, which is the 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 direct political influence, not political influence, but the um the hand that politicians direct to play in in anti renter and pro landlord uh, legislation. And the reason that this happens is because surprise surprise, the vast majority of your politicians are landlords themselves. Because again, it's this this ooh speculative you know asset. This this um uh if you want your way to wealth is through fucking you know uh buying up all these streets and and having poor people move in and extracting um, uh, rent from them. Yeah. And you see this, for example, in the United States, uh, where whenever legisl- anti, uh, what's it called, uh, um, anti-renter legislation is being passed, um, it's, of course, passed by a Congress that is majority land- uh, landlord. Same thing with the uh, ministers of parliament in, in the UK. Vast majority of them are also landlords, too. Um, and uh, particularly when it's a motion regarding renting. Uh, for example, in the UK, there was a... Uh, just a couple of years ago, a, a um, uh, legislation that was about to be passed to for uh, you have to ensure that the apartment that you're renting out is fit for human habitation, and that was shot down, yeah. if you can believe it, by majority landlord. You know, uh, because they don't care about people; they just want profits. These are literal fucking demons. Um, <laughs> but, like, I, no, there's no, there's no other way to put it. How can you, as a human being, like uh, ignore so, uh, like Marx says, ignore like and also ignore all this, just as a human being? right? How can you look at this shit and be like, you know what? Fuck that. Just for like, what? An extra like $200 a month or something? What is wrong with you? Fuck me. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. Um, uh, in all the quote-unquote democratic governments, uh, liberal democracies, you'll see an overrepresentation of landlords in their political structure co- as compared to the, the uh, general population. And you wonder why that is. It's because those people who have direct access to capital have the ability to engage more in politics because the rest of the population is too busy just trying to survive survive so then you end up being in this dictatorship of the bourgeoisie in which your opinion doesn't fucking matter what you want doesn't fucking matter unless you have capital that's why it's uh, the bourgeois democracies pretend to be democracies because even if you were to reach any position of power they wouldn't allow you to do anything right you don't have to say you don't have the influence you don't have the money from your renting to use for lobbying it's everybody who's anybody who has enough capital uh, knows that they need to diversify their investment portfolio and you have to have a certain part of your assets in secure assets. And property is always defined as one of the most secure assets. So you have to buy up shit. Politicians, very often, especially in the West, are extremely wealthy people. So they have what? They have investment portfolios. And because they have investment portfolios, they have what? Properties that they own <laughs> either for rent or just to keep so they can resell in the future at a, at a profit margin. Which is uh, what Hakim perfectly said. That it's, uh, the dictatorship of the, the bourgeoisie isn't just uh, uh, the, your boss at work, but it seeps over into the state which governs you because the only people, the majority of the people l- who are let into the Senate in the first place are, are bourgeois themselves. And that then applies not only to housing, but they have vested individual personal interests in, for example, not uh, making, not paying off student loans or not uh, allowing for free universities because plenty of these fucking people sit on boards of universities. Why are there boards of universities? Not, to, trust me, to keep up academic mm-hmm. standards, but because it's a for-profit mm-hmm. business, etc., etc. Apply that to every single industry and you will realize how no senator actually wants you, most senators don't actually give a fuck about imp- no, no, Joker improving society somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Honestly, yeah, yeah, honestly, honestly. All right, I, I think we've spoken extensively about all the, these uh, issues with, with renting. Maybe we can just briefly touch on potential solutions. Um, I don't even know if we'll have time today to go through the common arguments and do the debunking round. Maybe we'll have to say that for another episode. Um, let us know if you're interested in that, and we'll do it. It'll be like the communism yeah. no food, no toothbrush thing, maybe. Uh, but yeah, so maybe we can uh, maybe we can discuss a bit on 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 uh, the solutions, potential solutions. Um, 
Uh, there's a few it's of them. Mao knows. Uh, <laughs> exactly right, yeah. Um, Mao had a little thing where, uh, you know, uh, he would, do you know what he would do? He would just kind of, he would just invite the landlords to, for, just for a chat. Like, landlords, please, I just want to talk. I just want to I just want to talk. Join my right? Discord server. It, he invited them yeah. all to his Look, Discord server. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, uh, landlords and sparrows have a lot in common. <laughs> they both die easy. <laughs> 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 oh my God. <laughs> Niche, niche mouse memes. All right, um, but yeah, um, let 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 a uh, uh, hundred landlord heads bloom. Um, so <laughs> the <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, uh, the uh, several solutions exist. Um, of course, the the Mao one is the the favorite one, but let's talk a bit more in practicality. Um, uh, the uh, there's a concept co- that was uh, I read in the, in the Manchester Housing Action, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. It was called the People's Renting Sector. Um, the the basic idea of this was instead we break away from landlordism and have housing costs that you pay for for uh, property basically that you live in they would be limited to the cost of what you need to keep the house in, in you know basically a good state so it's not falling apart and fit for human habita- uh, habitation and also you have a small like fee that you contribute for uh, contribute for for uh, continuing the nation uh, uh, the national housing stock. Um, so rather than basically giving your rent to a landlord, you have a uh, certain sector of housing that is used that you basically live in and you pay for it to maintain it basically, and also a small fee so that you can increase housing stock and continuously build more housing. And research after research after research has shown that the increased um, building of housing, uh, like increased uh, housing construction, it, first of all, number one, increases people's incomes. Number two, it reduces crime. Number three, it increases educational opportunities. Number four, it increases people uh, people's ability to accumulate capital to save their own money is what it means, right? And number five, interestingly enough, it also increases people's um, uh, sociability. They reduces levels of loneliness, and it increases people's um, it improves people's health. It's be- it's actually um, th- 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 we'll probably discuss this in another episode about like socialist a- uh, approaches to to um, uh, urban development. But across the board, the number one best thing you can do as a society is build more housing, especially when there's a need for it, which in the vast majority of cities, there is a need for it, right? Um, by the way, I just remember this, and this is what ties back to way to the beginning to what uh, JT mentioned, but I forgot to mention it, uh, about the Airbnb points. Um, the vast majority of third world capitals or major cities in, in the rest of the world, uh, the urban centers and, and places where people, especially young people from those countries who benefit from living, are usually bought up by investment uh, firms or basically individuals lost lots of money and then just turned into Airbnb so that people who would otherwise be dynamic young individuals who can contribute to the economic development of their country um, in these major uh, third world cities, uh, these apartments, instead of going to them, go to basically, oh, you know, the same cycling of tourists uh, every two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, for, and the only for reason Airbnb it's talked purposes. about, and it, the only reason it's talked about the political local elite when the, the, they come up and buy them and turn them into Airbnbs, it's because the local bourgeois can't afford to buy up so many apartments to turn them into Airbnbs. It's foreigners that come and buy them up and turn them yeah. into Airbnbs. Yeah. So the local bourgeois exactly. is pissed at the other bourgeois. It's always so <laughs> yeah. beautiful to exactly. see. Exactly, hilarious but yeah uh, but back to the point sorry that, that i mentioned the, the people's renting sector the idea there is that there would be a uh, transition uh, a transition that's not the right word uh yeah no transition is, is, is correct english excuse me transition, a transition is transference if you want to yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right yeah uh transition or transference um from landlords a uh, property trans uh transference from landlords to common ownership uh, just common social ownership instead, because that way you can actually end up with, well, you know, something that benefits the rest of society. Now, here's the issue. Run this by any bourgeois liberal democratic fucking order, and you are going to be, uh, if you're not going to be shot, <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, you're going to be vilified. There, there's no way you're going to do this. And uh, the only way that this has been accomplished historically is either during socialist revolution or being right next to a country that just had a socialist revolution. So yeah. the example of the social democracies of Europe happened to just be right next to the Soviet Union. So that's why they had incredibly expansive um, uh, public housing sectors uh, that could be protected from the, the grubby fucking hands of, of landlords. Um, but the the, the uh, number one solution that would actually be tenable, of course, with most the first step to solving most of society's problems at this point is social, be it environmental, be it health-wise, being uh, with housing, being with uh, employment, etc etc usually is the institution of socialism the way that socialism would deal with this is number one forcibly bringing um housing under uh, under common ownership right if you are somebody who owns 14 properties you get to pick which property you want to live in 
and the rest of your properties will be taken away from you. They will be expropriated yep. by the state, but you will be recompensed for this. I'm I'm personally of the opinion that um, unless you're some douche who's like you know you like went full fascist and and picked up a gun, it's like if, if you're that case, then fuck you. Even the first apartment you don't get. All right, you're gonna yeah. go and you're gonna go work in the mines. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're gonna get the two bowls of cabbage soup, like Zizek said. All right. <laughs> <laughs> These are jokes. We'll make sure he gets have. two portions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he'll get say, we'll be kind. We'll give you the two portions of, of cabbage soup. Um, but uh, no, what, what I'm saying is, I personally think that um, in in uh, my ideal. A socialist revolution these people who own several properties that you get to pick which property you want to maintain and you want to keep and the rest of them will be taken they'll be expropriated and they'll be used for actual uh, economic benefits they will be used to house people or be turned into businesses if they're central and, and, and useful for those purposes uh, but you should be compensated and this compensation can be a discussion between you and the government and how you want this to take place that's number one number two um, a socialist country a socialist state would have a fundamental priority uh, of maintaining and building further housing Right. Some people like to talk about, oh, but it's so depressing. The, the Soviet housing box. Number one, the, do you know what's actually depressing? Be homeless. Uh, number two, <laughs> what's even more depressing, in my opinion, is being in a fucking American suburb. All right. Because at least if you're in an Amer- at least if you're in a Soviet commie block, you are in a city. You're not 40 miles outside the fucking city and you have to get into a car that you can barely pay the gas to, for in order to drive all the way just so you can drive by 17 fucking big box stores until you get to something <laughs> decent. Right. This sounds like hell to me. I'm sorry. You can't you cannot tell me that that whatever. That's my personal opinion. You and if you have a different opinion, you're you're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) But sorry, sorry. I'm just teasing. The reason that uh, oh, call me call me blocks and all that bullshit. Number one, uh, housing stock was destroyed by several wars and and, and instability in the region because of World War One. And then. yeah, World War One and then World War Two, yeah, exactly. But people seem to really underplay this point. They, they pretend like this is a small blip in the thing. You know, like forty percent of the Soviet housing stock was destroyed in World War Two. Can you imagine if forty percent of housing in the United States was destroyed? Yeah. The United States already doesn't have enough housing. 40% I mean, okay, of no, people more would than be enough homeless, houses. like yeah, literally. But, if yeah, that yeah, happened, forty yeah, percent would be exactly. homeless for like twenty years. So they had to very rapidly do prefabricated building uh, to to just basically house people. Um, number one and number two. That shit was also um, built in the fifties, bro. For yeah, given for exactly. free. Like you can't compare it to what a socialist government would build now, even if it yeah, would exactly need to right. build because there's more stable. than enough property yeah. for everyone. Sorry for interrupting. It just yeah, pissed me exactly. off. Yes, continue. No, no, but you're completely right. You're completely right. This is the the, the fucking the, the the what makes it so difficult to get this point across. Um, currently we have more than enough housing a, a modern social state would have much more stability and the amount of development of science and, and refinement of, of materials and whatnot has gotten us to a point that it would be even cheaper and more quicker and more automated etc etc um, and also um, if you look at uh, videos and pictures of the era, like the 70s and 80s, of those ooh, ugly comic blocks, they were stunning. They were beautifully painted and well-maintained. The reason they look like shit now is because nobody has maintained them for 40 years. You can look at n- nowadays, actually, in select areas uh, in these, like, for example... Uh, they have refurbished look up, them uh, and they look fucking great. Like yeah, half of the ones exactly. that in, the, in the neighborhood where I fucking live, they look very decent. And then there's the, like half of them are refurbished, the other half isn't. And obviously one is falling apart and the other one looks pretty fucking good. Including yeah, the hallways, exactly right, including yeah. it's not only on the outside and the aesthetic and the windows, blah, blah, blah. It's it's. And, of course, in the, in a socialist country, uh, if you want to own your home, first of all, in many different instances, you can literally just be given in a home. Uh, even if you had to take out a loan, it would be a 0% interest loan that you would take, that you basically just have to pay back the, the exact amount. And by the way, you have a guaranteed job and guaranteed employment and guaranteed everything. So you're, you, you have no risk. Back, this yeah. is basically... Yeah, 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 there's no risk in this in this uh, loan. And number uh, three, most importantly, if you were to rent, rent was pegged to like 4% of your uh, monthly salary. If even, if even, by the way, right? Um, so the, the entire issues that modern um, uh, capitalist countries would face are basically non-existent. That doesn't mean that there won't be issues with housing. In every so- social system, there will be some sort of issue with housing. Um, and with uh, man's hubris, people are never fucking happy. Um, but... Uh, you know, you give a starving man food and then he, he eats a bit. And then after a couple of months of eating decently, then all of a sudden he's like, you know what? Actually, uh, I want some seasoning. He's like, okay, get some seasoning. So they eat food that's nicely seasoned. He's like, you know what? I want more. So he gives them more food. He's like, now I want more variety. And I want, blah, 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 blah. right? Man is never grateful. That's his nature, sadly. Um, so uh, that's not too, that's a very boomer way of, I just realized of what I said. <laughs> but you understand <laughs> what I mean, right? Um, there's a, 
uh, side point um in in cockshot's book um how the world works he mentions the fact that when, when marx talks about post-scarcity uh, as being a prerequisite for communism uh post-scarcity society his concept of post-scarcity is basically what what we currently have yeah. post-scarcity means we have the ability to feed everybody and give everybody housing that's basically what post care and and employ everybody which is exactly what we have now but now because of uh, uh, i don't know if you want to call it lifestyle inflation or not i think these things are good people have uh increased education opportunities uh people have access to internet etc etc electricity everywhere these are new things that have now become modern staples of life so post scarcity now would have to include include those things so that's what i mean how, how things just change by definition across time as we develop as a species um but uh bringing it back of course the um, socialist example is one that we can look at and learn from and in the future it can heavily improve on and it would solve modern uh, housing issues most importantly as well um and just a final note and then everybody can take it away from me um rent controls which are something that some uh, usually advocated by social democrats usually uh, aren't that good so rent controls usually uh, cause issues with reduced um because oh it's free market and we're not going to build as much now because they want to uh, still even elevate prices um, all the research so far that has, has been inconclusive on if, if they would end up helping at all and usually they end up causing really long queues for for um, uh, getting ownership especially if it's public ownership etc a much better way than rent controls is to just simply build more housing um, but of course an even better issue uh, a better solution is socialism so, somebody please take it away from me <laughs> All I w uh, all I I would add is that all of these solutions applied to the current developmental stage of capitalism would work 100%. Mm. And we're talking about policies that in some cases have been thought up like 50, 60, 70 years ago. So if all of mm. these would work, imagine if we also think up as we go obviously uh, policies which can uh, alleviate all housing issues uh, post-revolution, just how effective, efficient, quick, uh, and painless uh, the whole process uh, mm -hmm. can be. As long as, obviously, we remember not to be uh, too revanchistic and uh, you know, too vengeful post-revolution, which we know some of our comrades would <laughs> like to enjoy, but uh, you know, that would be us just shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, unless you know Trotsky is comes in, unless it's a world revolution, <laughs> 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 then there would be nobody to stop us. Oh, hang the fucking landlords. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where's the lie? But anyways, <laughs> these are jokes, people. These are jokes. All right, and, and, and with that said, uh, that is our preliminary thoughts on housing. There's so much more we can talk about. There's a lot more in the notes that we didn't get around to. Um, let us know if you're interested in an episode going through landlord arguments, and we'll probably mix it with, in with something else. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's up to you guys. Um, let us know what you think. Uh, otherwise, thank you to everybody who supports us on the Patreon. Um, the, of course, without your support, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so very, big, very big thanks to all you guys. Um, the subreddit has actually grown to like 2,000 people, I think, now, which is really, really good. So thank you guys for I, <laughs> listening to me and joining. There's some banger <laughs> memes. Keep them coming. Otherwise, uh, yeah, that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. I'm Hakim. This has been the program. Fuck, I'm Hakim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm JT. And I'm Ugopnik. Your landlord. <laughs> 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 <laughs>